welcome to our service of praise and worship to our God, in which God blesses us through his word as we look to his word and sing songs inspired by his amazing word and as we have the word explained to us in a sermon as well. We are continuing our sermon or message series based on Paul's letter to the Romans. And this week we will be getting into Romans chapter 8, which is as a chapter sometimes called the Great Eight. So I'm eager for us to get into it. Uh, we are going to be looking at the role of suffering in our lives, as well as the perspective that we have beyond the sufferings that we have in this life as well. You'll see that emphasis in our lessons and songs, as well as the sermon. If you could please like and share with others this video, and please fill out the This Sheep Showed Up form. The link to that form can be found in the description for this YouTube video. Thanks for doing that. We will begin with our first song. It's called Sing a New Song to the Lord. God bless your worship of him. Sing a new song to the Lord. He to whom wonders belong. Rejoice in his triumph and tell of his fire. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. With you. Were we to praise God outwardly, yet, yet inwardly we have, have prideful and arrogant hearts, we would be depriving ourselves of the deep help that God gives. And, and we, we would be depriving others of receiving God's, God's blessings through us. Through us. God created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve, and deserve only, only his, his wrath, wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I have been sinning even from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But, but trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let's sing a song of praise and thanksgiving to God for his forgiving heart toward us. The song is called, O oh, Taste and See. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in him. 
in your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues forever. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive your word with joy and to bring forth fruits in faith and hope and love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson comes from the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. This is right after the first sin that Adam and Eve committed. And this is God letting Adam and Eve know what the sufferings would be like that they would have to go through now that they had created a fallen existence for themselves and for the whole earth. Genesis chapter 3. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband. And he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the Tree of Life. This is the word of the Lord. Our next reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. This is much later in the Bible, after the first reading that we had. This is right at the uh, crucifixion and death of Jesus. Just as Jesus died, because of his work, it's as though the suffering and fallenness of the world was, in some way, being undone. Even the curse of death. Matthew chapter 27. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. We now will sing our next song. It's called, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. I 
righteousness I dare to make no other claim But wholly lean on Jesus' name On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand When darkness veils his lovely face I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand His oath is covenant and blood Support me in the raging flood When every earthly rock gives way He then is all my hope and stay On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand When he shall come with trumpet sound Oh may Righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. If you will allow yourself to be challenged, if you will submit yourself to being grown by God's word, then keep listening. We've already looked at a lot of Paul's letter to the Romans. And what we've discovered is that Paul has a lot to tell God's people. There's a lot that they either didn't know at all or didn't know very well. So what Paul was doing was revealing, revealing things that were hidden or hard to understand, things that Paul was now making clear. It's not like Paul was entertaining the believers in Rome by what he wrote. Paul wasn't sharing with them nice words, but important and substantive words. If you haven't been following along with this message series, I invite you to take some time, maybe even right now, to look back over the last several weeks of service videos and find out what has been revealed in this letter we've been looking at. Paul revealed what's true about the guilt we feel for our moral failures. Paul revealed what's true about human belief in God and really human belief in anything. Paul revealed the heart of God that's behind all the big things that God has done in our world. Paul revealed what believers should cherish about other believers. And that's only a fraction of what Paul revealed. There's a lot in this letter. But then, in the verses that we've now arrived at, in chapter 8 of the letter, Paul is going to mention a topic that, I guess, in a way, you could say that Paul doesn't have to reveal anything to us about it. The topic is earthly suffering. And the reason Paul doesn't have to reveal to us what earthly suffering is, is that this world is still reeling from what happened in our first reading for today. After Adam and Eve fell from goodness into selfishness, God allowed the whole world to default into a fallen condition. Remember when God told Adam and Eve about the curses that the world would now suffer under? Well, Adam and Eve heard those words, but then learned more about what that fallen condition was like as they lived their lives, every day waking up to a fallen existence. By simply living their lives, Adam and Eve were learning about suffering. It didn't need to be revealed to them with any more words. It was simply life. And so, for us who are taking in words from God, with things that God is revealing to us through the pen of the Apostle Paul, let's be real about the fact that what God says in his word 
is not our only input. Suffering is also being revealed to us, not through special revealing by God in the Word, but through the aches and pains, through the betrayals, through the disappointments, through the fears that haunt us, through the shame that we hate to face, through the powerlessness we feel, through the relentlessly running clock and the super fast passage of time, through your mortality, through your doubts, through your sadness, through the chemical imbalances, through the complexity of life, through the miscommunications, and through the losses. Every day we wake up and face these things. But you're walking through Romans, and that means that you're learning in chapters 3 and 4, 5, 6, 7, so much about what God has done for you. Words like justified, reconciled, blessed, united, and redeemed and released and delivered. Paul has gone on and on about these important words, these important concepts. But what do you notice about those words? They're all in the past tense. Justified, redeemed, delivered. According to the Apostle Paul, God has done a bunch of stuff for you, historically, in real history, in your life, and it's set in stone. It won't change. But here's the really difficult thing, and maybe you know where I'm going with this, but all, with all that stuff that God has already done in your life, that stuff won't change, but your sufferings will. Your sufferings will shift. Your sufferings will surprise you. In some ways, your sufferings will increase and swell. And then Christian faith might not seem to be the thing anymore. All the past tense stuff, justified, delivered, reconciled, our lying enemy will twist the past tense in those moments of suffering so that you'll doubt that God can really help you with your modern life and your current problems. How can a God who redeemed and united and blessed really help you with the new addiction, with the secret sin you don't want anyone to know about, with the new argument from a close friend, a new argument against God? How can the God of history save you in a future that will threaten to destabilize you in all sorts of unforeseen ways. What if your present sufferings then will be more than your present sufferings now? Will it seem like enough for your soul at that time to have a God that doesn't change? Now you're ready for the words that Paul wrote. Words not focused so much on what happened in the past, nor what's happening now, nor what might happen in the next season of your life. Paul instead reveals to us what is still waiting to be revealed, something further in the distance, something glorious. We're in Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 18. Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. If you or I never read the Bible before, we might think that the Bible is going to be full of really fluffy thoughts, not really addressing the tough stuff of life so that we can have the comfort of no troubles at all. But the Bible shows that throughout history, everyone's had lots of struggles of all different kinds. The human writer here, Paul, wrote at great length about all the troubles he had in his life, some of them caused by himself, some of them coming at him like a barrage that at times really was too much for him to handle. And here too, Paul doesn't say that we won't have sufferings in life, but he says that the sufferings will be eclipsed. The sufferings will be surpassed by the glory for us that has not yet been revealed, but will be revealed. In other words, if you thought that the stacking up of past tense words from earlier was a full and meaty set of blessings. 
then you're going to be even more blown away by the glory that at this time can't be described it's so great. Our present sufferings are not even worth comparing with that future glory. The help that God gives and is described for us in the Bible is like my wallet in high school. Back in high school, my friends and I used to do something a lot that you can't really do right now, That and that was go to the movie theater. We would see a lot of movies together. It was our thing. But we didn't just go to movies. We went to openings of movies at our local theater. We would go to the first showing, whether it was at midnight or not, for all the big action and sci-fi movies. And while all those tickets put together probably cost a lot, that's not the thing about my wallet I want to point out. It's not what was taken out of my wallet, but what was put in. You see, we didn't wait until the day of the movie premiere to buy tickets. We bought tickets weeks, even months in advance. And back then, you couldn't buy tickets online. You had to go to the cinema in person. And they would print you this thing that's probably a relic now. They would print and give to us a movie ticket. And I would put my movie ticket in my wallet so that I'd always have it with me, anxiously checking in my wallet throughout the day for days and days to reassure myself that I was going to go to the opening of the movie. I valued that ticket. And seeing the ticket in my wallet affected my attitude. The help God gives us in the Bible is an already help, like having the movie ticket in my wallet. And the help gives us in the Bible is a not yet help, like a movie that we haven't actually seen yet, haven't experienced, and that will be a million times better than even the wonderful feeling of seeing the ticket. And this has been the story of humanity since the beginning. Look at verse 19. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Most of the time when I turn on the radio, when I'm driving in my car, and I scan the radio stations, there isn't something playing that really grabs me. I tend to land on talk radio. I want to hear some good music, but the music has to match what I'm going through in that moment, and usually it doesn't. But there are those moments, right? When you're angry at someone and an anger song shows up, or you're thinking about that special someone and a gushy love song is playing, or you're really excited and your favorite band starts up, or you were down in the dumps, but now you're coming out of it, and Johnny Nash comes up singing, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. These musical moments are great, not because it's a great piece of music, but because that good piece of music matches what's going on in your life. God made it so that all of creation matches what's going on in the souls of us, starting with Adam and Eve. Those first people and all people, all the way down to us, we've had some major struggles within ourselves and with one another. It's a groaning. It's groan worthy. Just like the entire frustrated creation. Everything dies. Everything experiences loss. But the very fact that our world came into being means it will someday end. And there's someone at the helm for that, the God who made us. So even though in nature we see frustration and decay, we're meant to yearn for something that will undo all the bad. Creation is experiencing its own already and its own not yet. And that's meant to point us to answers in God's word that show that same dynamic not just for animals and plants, but for us who have even deeper struggles and need big answers. The way God has preserved the world is right in line with how God has helped us, giving us really big help already and promising incredibly bigger help later on that will make our present sufferings seem trivial and insignificant. In our next verse, Paul gives us one more aspect of this already not yet dynamic, verse 23. 
Not only so, not only is creation groaning, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Paul is saying that you already have the ticket in your wallet. You already have the Spirit working in you. And what does that mean? It could mean that you're noticing in yourself that you are growing in godliness. That would be the result of the Spirit's work. But Paul didn't say what exactly the first fruits of the Spirit are. Maybe it's simply faith that you have trust in God instead of in your own goodness or your own works. And that would be the result of the Spirit's work. But maybe Paul is saying that the fruit is the Holy Spirit himself. How does the Spirit get into your life? Through God's amazing word and through the momentous waters of baptism. You really can look back at your baptism in the name of Jesus and at the proclaiming of the message of forgiveness in Jesus as your ticket. Something that keep going back to every day so you can say to yourself, that's right, I already have this. I'll be blessed when the time comes, when even my body is done. And there's one more complication with this that I want to address. It's that we might experience nature and the Holy Spirit a bit differently than one another. Uh, the way that life has played out for you might have things getting slowly worse. Or your experience with nature and creation might have things getting slowly better and better. Really, we're probably going through lots of ups and downs throughout our lives. But our trajectory, trajectories are not running parallel with each other. And the work the Holy Spirit is doing might seem very different for us. I'm not saying that baptism or the word is different for different people, but perhaps you do feel like you're really growing in Jesus. Or maybe you feel like your spiritual journey is always one step forward, three steps back. But then how does this forward direction I've been talking about relate to the different paths we're on? And that brings us to our final verses. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. That final word I think could be better translated as with endurance. We keep pushing forward. That's an important aspect of Christian hope. But there's another important word here. Paul describes this already not yet dynamic with this really important word, hope. We really can look forward to what lies ahead for us. It might be way ahead for us or pretty soon, but, but we can hope. Not because we're naturally cheerful people or things in our lives seem to be going well. Instead, Paul says that it's in hope that we were, what? Saved. Do you know when you got saved? It's not just when you were baptized or had the word proclaimed to you. It's not just this thing in the future when you'll get to heaven. You got saved thousands of years ago when Jesus died on the cross for the sins that should have shattered your hope of being blessed from God. Instead, Jesus took upon himself that despair, crying out to his heavenly Father while he was on the cross, saying, My God, why have you forsaken me? God the Son experienced a greater decay and frustration than anything anyone on this earth has ever experienced. And what was Jesus' heart through all of it? With joy and hope, Jesus endured the cross for the joy and hope of earning your salvation. Jesus went through the already of punishment and wrath for the not yet but in the future making you a child of God. Jesus perfectly held on to hope so that you could have hope. So here's the challenge. Do the same thing that Paul in this passage did. Do you remember how the passage began? Paul wrote, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Did you catch the thing Paul said he was doing? He considered. He geared his mind in a certain direction, away from dwelling on his sufferings and toward hope. Not in a way to ignore his problems, but instead to focus on what God says to focus on. Have hope 
that God will bring you to heaven. Have hope that God will work through the church here on earth so we can not let ourselves get cynical or pessimistic about the church's mission. Have hope that God will grow you as the Bible passages you read truly work deep inside you. Have hope that God will make some divine blessing fall upon someone else for something you have to suffer through. Have hope that goodness still matters. We wait for the stuff that's not yet been revealed with hope and with endurance. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us to cherish the blessings you've already showered on us and help us to look with hope toward the blessings we can't even describe yet because it hasn't been revealed. Make us optimists about the things you care about. It is in your hope-giving name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Let's sing our next song, Looking Ahead in Hope and Joy. The song is called, Lord, When Your Glory I Shall See. Let's declare together the foundation for our hope with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing our next song. It's called Precious Lord, Take My Hand.
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the amazing hope that you give us, a hope that is so unique, so different from any aspiration that this world might offer to us. Give us sure hearts, confident in who you are, what you have done, and in the promises that you have made to us that we will spur one another on to be confident about, that you really will come through, that you are our faithful God and our Savior. Lord Jesus, please be with Faith Lutheran Church in Excelsior as they soon will receive their new pastor, Pastor Schmidt, moving up from Texas. Please give them warm relationships with one another of pastor and members and pastor's family with the entire congregation. And Lord, please be with Christ Lutheran Church in Eden Prairie as Christ Lutheran navigates these unprecedented times and moves forward with various ministry plans. Jesus, it is in your hands that we commend all people, including those who are vulnerable to the virus that is spreading throughout the world. And we ask that you please would give leaders of various kinds wisdom, patience, love, and determination to do what's right, to make good decisions, and to always strive for love. Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's sing our next song. It's called Brothers, sisters, let us gladly. Brothers, sisters, let us gladly give to God our all our best. Service hearty, thorough, honest, with a living love impressed. All our duty, all our striving, all our time to Him belong. Praise Him then with true devotion, come before Him with a song. By His mercy, by His bounty, by the gift of Christ his Son. What great goodness he has shown us, what high marvels he has done. Let us to him promptly, freely, yield our bodies and our souls. Thankful that his love protects us, that his wisdom all controls. Gracious Lord, accept our service, for the sake of Christ your Son. Lo, our hope abides now only in the righteousness he won. Bless and save us, help and guide us, watch to comfort and restore, till in heaven we rest rejoicing, praising you forevermore. Let's pray together one of the most amazing prayers ever. It's a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to show them the amazing and deep promises of God that they could rely on God for and that they could call on God to be faithful to. This is the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. We do not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, be at peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. 
the Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let's close out our service with our final song. It's called, Oh, How Good It Is. blessings of Jesus be your comfort now and forever. The Lord be with you. <laughs>